Hello, and uh, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about social cognition. Particularly, we're going to be talking about attitude and attitude change. Uh, first question to address is what do we mean by attitudes? These are the evaluation of objects or ideas to indicate our like or dislike towards them. So think of this in terms of attitude towards something or someone. So we talk about attitude development as whether or not you uh, like a particular person or a particular thing. And we'll talk a little bit about what influences this type of uh, feeling or behavior. So where do attitudes come from? First, they can be conditioned. So a quick review, classical conditioning, of course, is um, also known as Pavlovian conditioning, uh, where we have an automatic response. So we pair a formerly neutral stimulus with a positive stimulus. That neutral stimulus can now uh, be seen of as seen as being positive. Uh, this is, of course, uh, how advertising often works by trying to pair the supposedly neutral stimulus like Coors Light with uh, positive stimulus like attractive people, something like this. Um, <coughs> and so you can sort of be classically conditioned to like a beer because it's associated with things that you might like. Upright conditioning is where rewards change our attitudes as well. Now remember, upright conditioning occurs when uh, behavior is followed either by um, something pleasurable or unpleasurable. So something pleasurable increases the probability of that behavior uh, and associations with it, brings positive associations versus punishment, which decreases behavior or uh, associations with that behavior. Um, so things like developing a crush on the person that works at Starbucks because you see them and then you get your coffee, something like that. Attitudes also might be inherited. Uh, we know that people inherit psychological characteristics which may predispose them to like or dislike certain things. Um, one of the things we've seen in particular uh, are political attitudes and um, liking of even things like jazz music uh, seem to have some inheritance to them. Implicit attitudes are attitudes that influence our feelings and behavior at an unconscious level. So uh, dual attitudes occur when we have an explicit attitude that is different from an implicit attitude. And this is particularly important for understanding racial stereotypes, in particular because we oftentimes are not fully consciously aware of our associations with people of other races or even of our own race. So this is why um, psychologists have developed what's called the Implicit Attitudes Test, or the IAT, which is supposed to determine whether or not you have automatic associations with which you are not conscious. <coughs> so uh, you can actually uh, take a few of these online. Uh, there are there's the uh, what's called the weapons IAT, uh, which looks at whether or not you associate uh, weapons uh, with people of particular races and particular their faces, um, and is a, a pretty interesting way to explore uh, this kind of implicit attitude. Cognitive dissonance occurs when there is a contradiction between two attitudes or between some attitude and a behavior. The basic assumption is that dissonance causes anxiety and tension, and people are therefore motivated to reduce dissonance. Uh, this is starting to take on uh, some political importance uh, as we start to see uh, the sort of unfolding narrative of uh, the Trump administration. Uh, you start to see uh, hardened attitudes uh, for people who voted for President Trump uh, as uh, negative news comes out, uh, they have to sort of fight that kind of dissonance. And you see this even in people as they talk about it. Um, you saw this when, uh, with the healthcare debate recently. And so you see this kind of causative, cognitive dissonance. Um, and so people are often quite motivated to reduce that dissonance. Uh, one of the things um, we often look for, particularly when we're talking about political campaigns, are attitude changes. Our attitudes change oftentimes to reduce dissonance. And this is oftentimes uh, related to decisions we might make. Uh, Fessinger is one of the people who's most associated with uh, this, uh, is looking at how attitudes change according to uh, trying to reduce this kind of dissonance or this anxiety. So one of the things <laughs> that they discovered is you can have what's called post-decisional dissonance. Uh, after we have made a decision, our attitude is more positive towards the choice and more negative to the alternative which is not chosen. 
So to give you an example, you might choose one of these vehicles and then afterwards uh, your attitude towards the one you did not choose uh, would be more negative than it was prior to that. We see this also with um, things like well, car attitudes, owners towards cars increase, but attitudes towards trucks and SUVs decrease because they made the decision to buy a car. You get similar um, reverse findings with people who choose SUVs. We also see this happens, <laughs> sorry, it's a very old picture of me, um, when people are trying to decide between colleges to go to. So I chose to go to Colorado State. Um, and so when you get these kind of in-state rivalries, oftentimes because you've made a decision to support one team versus the other, uh, or what, because you've gone to school at one versus the other, your attitude towards the other is significantly, re significantly reduced. So one of the ways in which we talk about trying to change people's attitudes is through persuasion. Persuasion is the active and conscious effort to change attitudes through the transmission of a message. So this would be a, an example of kinds of propaganda that the United States uh, developed during World War II um, that tried to change uh, attitudes about the war and about uh, the Axis powers through this kind of propaganda. And so trying to change people's attitudes and their behavior through this kind of persuasive message. Um, <laughs> some of these are um, rather remarkable um, for uh, their uh, forthrightness, I guess I should say. So um, how does something like cognition enter this question of persuasion? So uh, this uh, elaboration likelihood model developed by Hovland you have to attend to a message, understand the message, find it convincing, and memorable. Um, so that's a lot of bits to occur. Um, one of the problems we have now, as we often hear, is people don't even pay attention to messages uh, that go against their current attitudes because they are so ingrained. So let's take a look at this elaboration likelihood model. It includes both a central route and a peripheral route. The central route occurs when people pay attention to arguments, consider all information, and use rational cognitive processes. So here we're talking about thinking about a candidate, what they stand for, what their proposals are, comparing them to another candidate, and then making a decision. So this is sort of the point of things like presidential debates. Probably need to update these photos a little. Um, but the um, candidate debates are intended to be this central route where we can see presidential candidates on stage, compare their arguments, and make a decision. The peripheral route occurs through minimal processing of messages. And so this is where campaign posters, bumper stickers, lawn signs, uh, are this kind of minimal processing of messages. And they do actually work. They uh, have been able to quantify sort of how many votes you can kind of get just by a number of lawn signs. Um, because people, as they're driving through, uh, see the uh, campaign lawn signs and where they are and uh, start recognizing names, which is even half the battle. You also then uh, sometimes get this bandwagon effect. So if you see all of your neighbors are voting for a candidate, uh, you might believe that you should vote for them as well. So here's the sort of summary of what this elaboration likelihood model looks like. So persuasive communication, are we motivated to process the information? No, well then it might be in the peripheral route. If yes, are we able to process this information? Yes. So then we get into cognitive elaborations, favorable thoughts, positive attitude change, unfavorable thoughts, so how we think about and um, evaluate this evidence is an important part of this. And then these peripheral cues are also potentially part of attitude change. So a number of cues influence whether or not a message is persuasive. The first of these is the source. Sources who are credible and attractive are thought to be more persuasive. Uh, so this is sort of the uh, ethos part of um, Plato's model of persuasion, which included pathos, ethos, and logos. Content, uh, distinctive information is remembered better and maybe more persuasive. Um, oftentimes we find that stories are particularly persuasive, uh, far more so than, say, statistics. And so oftentimes you see 
individuals pointed out and their story is told as a way to be persuasive. Finally, the receiver, the similarity between the source and receiver also has an influence. If it's someone um, that you think is like you, then you um, have are more likely to believe them. Now this is particularly an interesting problem for politicians uh, because oftentimes they need to get people who are um, sort of blue collar, uh, oftentimes not college educated, um, and so the more polished, persuasive they might sound, the less like the receiver they might seem. And so obviously there's also gender and race issues in this, so this is a particularly uh, troublesome time um, because people oftentimes don't want to, particularly I think now, we see people really wanting what they thought, think of as an outside candidate, and we're seeing this certainly worldwide. So how do we develop attitudes about other people? Well, we call these oftentimes attributions. Um, there are a couple of different kinds of uh, ways in which we make attributions. One of these is a primacy effect, and this is in an area we call impression formation, a particular kind of, of uh, attribution. The research really does indicate that your first impressions uh, really are incredibly important. Uh, so in this research, you find that the first things people know about you set a point at which they then adjust up or down from. So uh, in uh, cognitive psychology, we talk about what's called the anchor and adjustment heuristic. So when people make decisions, they uh, sort of set an anchor and then move up or down from there. So that first impression is when you s or sort of drop anchor and people are going to either increase their attitude towards you from there or decrease their attitudes towards you from there. And so if your first impression is terrible, you have a lot of work to overcome from that. The next issue to discuss are personal attributions. These are explanations that refer to internal characteristics such as abilities, traits, moods, and effort. So these are things we attribute to you personally. Um, so we're going to talk here in a minute about what's called the fundamental attribution error. So uh, when we talk about a personal attribution, we're talking about something that is clearly, that's you, that's all you, that's your ability, that's your mood, your trait, etc. Situational attributions are explanations that refer to external events, such as the weather, luck, accidents, or the actions of other people. So for example, um, I missed class yesterday because uh, I slipped running to catch a bus on Tuesday uh, and wrenched my hip, uh, and so that would be a situational attribution. Um, a personal attribution would be that I'm rather clumsy, and both of those would actually probably be true. Um, but uh, I apologize again for missing class, but that was uh, one of these things that just happens. The fundamental attribution there then is when we tend to assign personal attribution to others and situational attributions to ourselves. Um, so I always try to fight against this. Certainly I will say that uh, being clumsy is uh, something that I am well known for. Um, but we always have to watch out for this because we want to make sure that uh, when we talk about how someone else uh, has ended up in their situation um, that we think about both situational and personal attributions because both are potentially true. Um, you see this again a lot. Uh, in recent discussions of things like health care. Um, an individual recently um, said that poor people don't want health care because they're lazy and don't take care of themselves. That's a very personal attribution and probably one that um, certainly needs to be fought against. Theory of mind uh, is something we've talked about previously. Uh, and this is our capacity to wonder about the mental states of others. So we use these to we use theory of mind to make attributions about the intentions of others. So we try to figure out what is that person up to, what is their motivation, uh, etc. So we talked about this already uh, a little bit, but we have mirror cells, which are sets of cells, which uh, respond to both initiating a facial expression and perceiving a facial expression. And we believe this is used to help us try to understand what someone's motivation is, what their emotional state is, because it allows us to kind of get at um, those same emotions in ourselves by activating the same sets of neurons. So final note in this um, first bit on social cognition is about agency. Uh, and this is an important question, I think, what we call a desire for agency. And when agency, we mean that we are sort of our own, in charge of our own destiny. Um, and so one of these questions are, uh, that I get into is, uh, in this area, is um, 
is something due to agency? That is it due to somebody's actual actions? Oftentimes, even agency is attributed to deities and gods and whatnot. Um, or uh, how much of it is just due to luck uh, and other such things? Uh, something to think about. We'll pick up on uh, stereotypes in our uh, next